All right. Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Andy Barlow uh, and with the Barlow Brain and Body Institute. Tonight, what we're going to go over over the next 20 minutes is the frontal lobe. And then when you finish this little 20 minute course, uh, you'll be able to actually go out and, you know, talk talk to a patient and go, you know, I wonder if this person has a frontal lobe issue. So let's let's kind of get right to this. So when we look when we look at the frontal lobe or look at the brain, so when we break this down, the frontal lobe, which is in the front part or then in front of the, the central sulcus, this makes up about 38% of the entire brain. Uh, please forgive me here. I'm kind of writing sideways. 38% uh, of, of the brain. So what we have is we have the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, temporal lobe, and then we have the occipital lobe. But believe it or not, the cerebellum and the brain stem is actually part of the brain as well. Some people kind of get lost in that and think, well, it's just, you know, the, the cerebral cortex. Now, remember, when we talk about the cerebral cortex, uh, this, this the outer layer is six layers thick in the human brain. So uh, this outer layer of the, of the cerebral cortex, which is part of the frontal, uh, parietal lobe, temporal lobe, and occipital lobe, and then what this six layers does, it processes all the information going in. So information that comes from the body that goes to the thalamus into the frontal lobe, then the frontal lobe has to send messages down to the basal ganglion, back to the thalamus, back to the cerebellum, to the to the uh, to, to the brain stem, and all of that goes on in that uh, six layers in in the cortex. Now, when we're dealing with the frontal lobe, okay, remember that uh, the the basic anatomy here is if we look at it from the side. <clears throat> the middle cerebral artery uh, actually controls the side, is, is the blood flow to the side part of the brain here. So we actually need to Google, which I'm not going to do this tonight, but you need to Google um, homunculus brain because you need to know where all the body parts are actually mapped out in your brain. So when we look at the lateral side, it's the middle cerebral artery. And then when we actually look at the... Uh, front part of our brain, uh, I believe this is called, uh, please forgive me if I'm wrong here, but you cut this, uh, what is that, coronal view, uh, and we've got in here, we've got the anterior cerebral artery that controls the, the parasagittal space, so you got the right brain, left brain, they come together in this little space right here, it's called the parasagittal space, and basically, in a nutshell, everything from our low back all the way down to our feet, including our genitalia, is in this medial part of this parasagittal space. So if we get this basic anatomy down, then we can actually start to look at this and go, wow, when we when we don't move uh, parts of our body, okay, we can test this with, with this little uh, gauge, and we can actually test the temperature of our hands and our feet. So uh, I think we kind of get lost in the frontal lobe just controls you know movement well the frontal lobe uh, it controls movement it can talk controls our thought process it inhibits uh, our limbic system so our frontal lobe if we actually look at this okay let me back up with the testing the temperature so if you look at the temperature and we test our hands we see that the middle cerebral artery is also not getting blood flow because our hands are only going to be expressed outwardly as to how well our brain is functioning our lower extremities, again, in our feet, if we're getting decreased blood flow to our feet, all the healing is in the blood. So if we're not getting adequate blood flow to the feet, the area of our middle cerebral or, uh, anterior cerebral artery, please forgive me, the anterior cerebral artery is also not shunning blood flow into that area. So we're losing blood flow in the brain, and it's being uh, a symptom of that is going to be cold feet in the anterior cerebral artery uh, and then uh, cold hands in the middle cerebral artery. So when we look at the frontal lobe, just to break this down, the, what's presynaptic to the frontal lobe is one of the things that's going to be our parietal lobe. So the back half of the brain, okay, is presynaptic to the frontal lobe. So we take all of this input into our body, like from the parietal lobe, visual uh, from our parietal lobe, temporal lobe, uh, hearing, uh, sound, uh, what we see, and then the parietal lobe, what it's, uh, the, I'm sorry, the, the frontal lobe, what it's going to do is it's actually going to take all of that information coming in and go, is this a threat to me? Is this is something I can use in my life? Is that a friend over there? Is that a foe? Is that a tree falling down in my direction? 
So your your frontal lobe is is the logical part of your brain. And and this just as a side note, part of the business part of, of what we do, a lot of times people try to talk too much to the logical part and the actual gut of you know your communication is actually your subconscious brain. So you've got your subconscious brain that makes these gut decisions and then your frontal lobe actually makes logical decisions. So when you're communicating with somebody, just as a side note, me using the words, me using the words is actually impacting your frontal lobe because this is logic and we're actually stimulating the frontal lobe uh, as part of that, the logical aspect. But then whenever we start dealing with the psychological aspect of communication, then we use our hand gestures, our posture, are leaning in when we get ready to talk to somebody or listen to somebody. Are we happy to see this person? So I don't mean to get too far into that, but when we're actually communicating with people, we want to actually stimulate the logical part, which is our frontal lobe, and then our subconscious mind, which is we do that through uh, tone, body language, and uh, and basically gestures. Okay. All right. So frontal lobe, when we break this down, its main this is just easy to understand is just think of face. This is the acronym. It's focus, attention, concentration, and executive function. It also inhibits our uh, anterior cingulate, which is part of our limbic system, and uh, it controls our impulses, uh, sexual impulses, rage. You know, this is what your frontal lobe, if it's healthy, is what actually keeps you from somebody cuts you off <clears throat> on the way home tonight uh, from pulling out your 380 and popping a cap in their ass. So, you know, if we were back 100 years ago, you know, somebody gets, you know, pisses you off and your frontal lobe is not functioning very well, then you get irritated. You can't inhibit those limbic responses. Oh, he did me wrong. So, bam, okay, so, or bam. So, your frontal lobe had to do with inhibitor, in, inhibiting these primitive structures called the limbic system. So, see, that's one of the components of this. When you lose your frontal lobe, we become more limbic in nature, more like a Neanderthal. <clears throat> and, and then, see, the key component here focus, attention, and concentration. When you lose this frontal lobe, this is going to be one of the first things that happens. <clears throat> and this is why understanding the anatomy of this and what their functions are, then we can actually go, wow, this person is actually, their frontal lobe is starting to kind of tank just a little bit. Okay. So now also, uh, this, this is the cognitive aspect, but our frontal lobe here in this very front part here in front of this central sulcus, uh, this is area four, our primary motor cortex. And this is actually where we move. Okay, so this is where the homocular map is uh, in your brain for the motor cortex. And then in the parietal lobe, which is not a, I'm not going to get into that very much, three, one, and two. In the parietal lobe, I know I know that it's, you know, one, two, three, but this is the way it's numbered in the parietal lobes. I don't want any Mississippi jokes. It's like this guy can't even count. So, but it's three, one, and two in the in the in the parietal lobe. So the information from your parietal lobe, your muscle spindles, your goji tendon organs, your marcles, your misers, your fritzinian, your finny corpuscles, all of those fire into your parietal lobe. And then see this parietal lobe is what feeds forward to keep our frontal lobe functioning. So this is why it's so important for me when patients come in that I test large diameter afferents, light touch, uh, two point discrimination, vibration, rifini. Because what I want to know is, is this information first getting into the parietal lobe? And I know that the parietal lobe is presynaptic to the frontal lobe. And that's what keeps our frontal lobe healthy and functioning. Because if we lose these large diameter afferents, we're going to lose the stimulation that keeps our frontal lobe alive. And we're not going to be able to release brain-derived neurotrophic factors. We're not going to be able to create neuroplasticity in the brain and we're going to lose the conductivity and the first symptom of that is going to be focused attention and concentration and then we start losing executive order uh like goal setting uh setting uh, uh uh let's see sorry about that there was something popped up on my screen so goal setting um uh being able to uh plan things out organize you know i tell people all the time if i came to your house and what would it look like? If I went and looked in your car, what would it look like? If it's completely disorganized, your entire life is more than likely disorganized because the way you do one thing is the way you do everything. 
And so if you can't control your car, which you own, how in the world are you going to be able to control a business or being an entrepreneur or controlling other people's lot, not controlling, but teaching other people, if you can't just control and organize your own car, sales, home, okay, so because your business is just an outward expression of who you are as a human being. So we got the motor cortex, but what the motor cortex does, the area four, when it's when it actually is excited, all it does is just does, it just has a movement. And this is why we have to have the cerebellum and the basal ganglion working together with the frontal lobe. Because if I want to, let's say I want to reach out with my right arm and, and grab this temperature gauge, uh, see my basal ganglion and my visual cortex, area five and seven, says, hey, here's where this, this uh, uh, object is, and I want to reach out and touch it. So, and see, if, if my, once my uh, area four fires, all I do is it's just a spontaneous firing. It's non-controlling. So, see, my cerebellum actually controls and coordinates the movement, and my basal ganglion actually gives me the oomph to actually put in the correct uh, con motor con control and motor contraction and actually move toward that. And then my occipital lobe, Prior lobe five and seven goes, this is where it is in space. Now go get it. Okay. So, but basically, area four is where our homocular mouth is located. And then when it fires, all it's going to do is activate that part and move it. Then the cerebellum and basal ganglion has to control and coordinate the movement. Now, in front of this, we have area six, which is our premotor. And the premotor is more like an orchestra. So if I want to reach and grab this, of course, I'm going to use my hand, but then the, the pre-motor has to, has to put all of this together. I can't just move my hand. I actually have to move my shoulder and my elbow and my wrist and my fingers. So think of area six as the orchestra and then area, <clears throat> let me back up, the conductor, area six is the conductor and, and uh, the primary motor area four, these are the individual players. Okay, so area four is the individual players in the orchestra, and then area six is actually the conductor. Now, if we if we look inside this uh, parasagittal space here, we have what's called the uh, supplemental motor cortex, and this works with the cere cerebellum to control and coordinate movement. So this is one of the things I do with rock, paper, knife, and so you can do this tonight with anybody. Rock, paper, knife. Okay, do so when we do this, number one, are we able to activate? Is the person paying attention and being able to focus, pay attention and concentrate and do it in the right order? Can they do rock, paper, knife? But then also I'm seeing is is the area four firing, is area six firing, is the supplemental motor cortex, do we have a rhythmic movement here? And then is the basal ganglion firing because the basal ganglion is not firing like it should have. It can be really, really slow or really, really hard and choppy. All right. Now we have what is called apraxia, where you tell somebody to do this rock, paper, knife, and they just can't do it. That's apraxia. This is going to be when we get into this prefrontal area, prefrontal cortex. Uh, we This is when it's damaged that we actually have apraxia. We actually can't even initiate the movement. Okay. Then we have dyspraxia where we're doing it, but we're kind of all over the place. Okay, dyspraxia is really, really slow. We also, in our front lobe, we have area eight. Okay, and this somewhat confuses people sometimes because area eight is our frontal eye field. Now, what happens with our frontal eye field, this is a, this is a saccadic eye movement. A saccade is an all or nothing type of eye movement. So if I'm looking at this finger here, this is my left finger, and then I saccade to the right, what I'm doing is I'm activating this area eight in my left frontal, frontal eye field or in my left frontal lobe, <clears throat> which to me just makes perfect sense because if there's something over here I want to grab and I the first thing I have to do is look at it, okay? And for me to look at it, let's back up. If I want to grab something right here in space, well, my right hand is controlled by which frontal lobe? Left, okay? So I see it and then my my brain has to guide this hand in to grab the object. So uh, the left frontal eye field is going to saccade to the right, and then my right hand, which is controlled by my left front, my left brain, then I just guide it right into that position. That's just, just how I make sense of the whole thing. So let's do this again. So the we look at the left finger, saccade to the right, boom. 
Okay, that's going to, I'm activating my left frontal eye field. When I saccade to the, to the left, I'm activating my right frontal eye field. So see what we can do is we can actually, if we know the anatomy, then we can go, all right, how would I activate the frontal lobe? Well, we know that uh, saccadic eye movements can do that. We know that vertical eye movements up and down can do that. Uh, vertical eye movements activate cranial nerve three and four, which is in the mesencephalon. This is the uh, interstitial nucleus of Cajal <clears throat> that's being activated for vertical eye movements, and vertical eye movements also activate frontal lobe. Now, another thing that we can do is uh, with with frontal lobe, frontal lobe activation uh, is, is if we can look at left brain versus right brain, and then we can ask a patient uh, things like, uh, can you take 100 and can you subtract 7 from it? OK, so if we do that, when we ask them to do this type of test, um, what we're doing is we're asking them to, can you focus, pay attention and can you concentrate? OK, and it's actually part of the working memory as well. All right. So we you know, we've got to put these numbers in our head and go 100 and then 73 and then 86 and then 79 and then 72. And on and on and on. So, all right, you'd be, be amazed that when people have these frontal lobe problems, especially in the left brain, you go, can you take 100 and crack seven? Then they're like, um, 94. You know, it's like, nope, and it's 93. So, can you take can you take 93 and subtract it from seven? And they're like, uh, 85. No, like, nope. So, anyway, you can see where I'm going there. They can't they can't pay attention. They can't focus. They can't concentrate. Um, another thing that you can do. For, for right brain is is right brain is more objects. Uh, left brain is more numbers. That's why uh, the uh, asking these linear types of questions are more left brain dominant, and then the right brain is more pictures, if you will. So uh, what we can do is a, we a person we find out hey they've got cold hands and cold feet. How do we know? Well, because we actually tested with this thermometer. I've had a different one. This is the cheapest one here. And then we're going to just for people who don't know, we're going to take a temperature, a surface temperature. And so like mine is uh, 89.9. We should have no more than two degrees and it's 88. So it's one. I'm not going to take my shoes off because we don't have time. But we shouldn't have more than two degrees between the face and the hands and face and the feet. So remember, cold hands, cold feet, cold brain. Hands are the medial cerebral artery, feet, anterior cerebral artery. Look at the homocular map. We said that, okay, we got decreased blood flow to the brain, which more than likely is going to lead to focus, attention, and concentration. Why would that happen? Because we've got decreased blood flow, all the healing is in the blood. All of your white blood cells, all of your hormones, all of your red blood cells, your oxygen, your blood sugar, all of that is in the blood. So if we've got the decreased fuel supply, well, the brain is not going to be able to activate properly. And we're going to have focus, attention, and concentration. So the, the research is really coming out. I shouldn't say research. There was a book that came out by a neurologist, and I don't have it with me. Um, and uh, he and his wife are medical neurologists, and they're basically saying that you need to test every patient over the age of 35 for this, focus, attention, and concentration, executive function, um, things like rage, those kind of issues, because actually at the age of 35, we're starting to lose our frontal lobe, and then these are symptoms of uh, dementia, which leads to Alzheimer's, uh, uh, frontal temporal demise, and those kind of things. So, um, and then we want, we can actually do a tuning fork test <clears throat> where what we're going to do is here is we're going to test the parietal lobe. And remember, the parietal lobe is presynaptic to the frontal lobe. So, we're going to take this tuning fork to the 187, I'm sorry, 128 hertz from uh, Miltex, M I L T E X. If you get the wrong kind, then it just doesn't do the job right. So, Miltex. we're going to take the tuning fork, we're going to put it on the sternum. That's going to be our baseline. And then we're going to compare the thumbs right and left. This is going to be a 10 up here. So all we're asking here is, is we know that the, that the parietal lobe is presynaptic to the frontal lobe. So are we losing any somatosensory input from our large diameter afferents? With most people with chronic health problems, the answer is absolutely. So this is the 10. We're going to test the thumbs. Is it more, same, or less? This is a 10. Give me a number. 
give me a number here, give me a number on the toes. So what we're actually testing here when we give a number on the finger, we're actually on the right hand, we're testing the left uh, parietal lobe area three, one, and two on the with the right thumb. And on the left thumb, we're at testing area three, one, and two on the right brain, doing the same thing on the lateral side, but we're doing the same thing on the toes. Now we're testing the parietal lobe in the parasagittal space. Everything should be a 10 just to keep it simple. And then I tell patients all the time, well, your thumbs are, pick a number, six, and your feet are three. So what's happening is we've got 40% loss of function here, 70% loss of function in the lower extremity. The parietal lobe is presynaptic to the frontal lobe. The frontal lobe can't get stimulated because it's only being stimulated by fuel, glucose, and, and activation, what's presynaptic or postsynaptic to it. Then we're going to ask them right into, tell me about your focus, attention, and concentration. Do you walk into a room and forget why you walked in there? Do you call somebody on the phone and forget why you called them? Are you in a conversation and you forget what you're talking about? Let's well, see, this is the focus, attention, and concentration. Now, what I'd like to do is find out, is this more left brain or right brain? I'm going to, for left brain, I'm just giving you just some bullet points here, telling you as a doctor, <clears throat> let's take 100 and subtract 7. We would do this in the clinic with patients. And then we can actually say what I'd like for you to do, I'm going to, for the right brain, <clears throat> we're going to say car, plane, umbrella, Empire State Building. Okay. And then we want to see if they can actually maintain that, you know, that thought process. So I just picked four of those out of the air. So see, all of those are objects. So the right brain is more into objects. Left brain is more linear calculations. One of the magics when it comes to uh, functional neurology is what we want to do is we find out uh, things that they can't do and guess what the therapies are. Whatever they can't do, that's the therapies. Now, I also said that the cerebellum is presynaptic to the frontal lobe. So one of the ways that we would actually marry this together is we can actually do a finger to nose. I'm going to have the patient close their eyes and I'm going to have them put their finger right on the tip of their nose. I'm going to touch their little finger. All right. Because if you look at the homocular map, your ring finger is actually the smallest and then your little finger is the next in, in, from a somatosensory standpoint. So the reason I want to pick on this little finger is because it already has the next to the, the least amount of sensory input coming in. So if it's damaged in any way, the likelihood of this being damaged is going to be greater than my thumb or my index finger. So these, these are the two I don't want to really use. So, <clears throat> so finger to nose, okay. And then I'm going to... Uh, contradict what I just said, because the next thing I'm going to do is have a patient take their, uh, close their eyes, and I'm going to bring, tell them to bring their fingers in, okay, and they can only miss by the width of one finger. So this is normal. Anything beyond that is abnormal. So if we have this, when we put our finger on our nose, and let's just say I miss right here, this breakdown, okay, then this is a left, this is a right cerebellar issue, <clears throat> and we know that the right cerebellum to the left brain. I'm not going to go through uh, the neurological pathway tonight. You can actually Google that. You can look it up or whatever. But the way we want to actually stimulate the brain on the contralateral side is we can actually do nonlinear complex movements. Another one for frontal lobe, which is very, very, very powerful, is uh, I'm sure we're about to get cut off here in just a minute because this is only good for 20 minutes. One of uh, uh, metronome. So you turn the metronome on at 54 beats a minute, you can clap your hands, you can clap your hip, uh, you can do uh, individual movements here. You can tap your toe like uh, on the beat and tap forward, tap middle, tap back. All of these are firing into our frontal lobe. And this timing mechanism where you hit your hand or your foot on the beat, this is part of your prefrontal cortex, the timing, prediction, controlling your movement, all of that's free frontal lobe, and you can do a free download on a, uh, just Google uh, metronome, put it on 54 beats a minute and go at it. So hopefully tonight, just as a recap, the, the point of the frontal lobe is 38% of the brain. Uh, the brain has the frontal lobe, parietal lobe, temporal lobe, occipital lobe, don't forget the cerebellum and brainstem. Focus, attention, and concentration and executive function is the major component. Your frontal lobe inhibits your limbic responses, which are uh, going to be the Neanderthal. And the limbic system is, do I run to it? Do I run from it? Do I mate with it? Do I kill it? Or do I eat it? So those are the things that our limbic lobe is in, in tune with. And we want to make sure in a civilized society, we're able to inhibit that 
and our frontal lobe is what inhibits those structures. So thank y'all very much. I hope you learned something tonight and then go into your, with your patients tomorrow and say, let me ask you some questions about your frontal lobe. Tell me about your focus, attention, and concentration. Do you walk into a room and forget why you walked in there? Do you call someone on the phone? Do you forget why you call them? Or are you in conversation and you forget, you forget what you're talking about? So thank you very much. Look forward to seeing you all next week. Thank you, Dr. Barlow.